Good evening. It's my pleasure to be a part of the instructional course lecture for the Cervical Spine Research Society in the session on complications. I'll be talking about esophageal injury. Uh, when we think about esophageal injury, we think about both major and minor insults to the esophagus, minor being dysphagia, although for patients it can be uh, quite significant, and major being esophageal perforation, either intraoperative or delayed. When we think about dysphagia, it really is a difficulty swallowing either liquids or solids, and both of these can lead to an increased risk of aspiration or even a pneumonia. After anterior cervical surgery, dysphagia most commonly involves an alteration in the swallowing biomechanics, which is really a combination of soft tissue swelling, esophageal dysmotility, and an altered sensation from nerve retraction. It is the most common complication after anterior cervical surgery, and most of it thankfully is mild and transient, but up to 15% can persist greater than a year. For a long time, we didn't measure uh, dysphagia adequately in our patients, either preoperatively or postoperatively, but there are now several questionnaires, some validated. Probably the most common, but not, quite, not yet validated questionnaire is the Bazaz, which really just grades uh, dysphagia as none, mild, moderate, or severe, depending on how the patient handles liquids and solids. More recently, the EAT-10, which is a validated questionnaire, has been used in several studies. It's a simple and easy to use 10 question item uh, where greater than scoring greater than three indicates dysphagia. Other questionnaires include the dysphagia short questionnaire, the dysphagia disability index, and the SWAL qual, which are a little bit more cumbersome. When we think about uh, dysphagia, we think about risk factors. This is a meta-analysis from 2017 that looked at several risk factors. And what it found was that female gender had an increased risk of dysphagia. Here you see that uh, multiple surgical levels, greater than two levels comparatively to one, had a higher risk of dysphagia, as well as a high cervical surgery being at C3-4 had an increased risk of dysphagia comparatively to the lower subaxial spine. A second systematic review in 2018 looked at both preventable and unpreventable risk factors for early dysphagia, and the unpreventable risk factors were similar, female gender, older age, multi-level surgery, revision surgery, as well as upper, upper cervical levels. Some preventable risk factors that were discussed in this article was, again, prolonged operative time, the use of BMP and changing of the endotracheal tube cuff pressure, which has not, uh, which has been equivocal in the literature. More recently, there's been discussion about whether IV or local, uh, locally applied steroids would make a difference in dysphagia. And there are two recent randomized control trials. The first published in JNS Spine had 140 patients with one to three level ACDFs with either Depomedrol on a collagen sponge or a collagen sponge alone. They looked at outcomes at six and 12 weeks and both radiographic outcomes and clinical outcomes. They did not see any difference in their clinical outcomes, either the mean swall qual scores or the mean change in the scores between the two groups. They did, however, notice a radiographic change with the um, steroid group having decreased swelling index immediately postoperatively, as well as at six and 12 weeks. In contrast, the other randomized control trial, which was 75 patients, uh, had a control group, local steroid and IV steroids, and looked at outcomes both pre or uh, dysphagia both preoperatively and out to 52 weeks. You see in all groups an increase in dysphagia immediately, which slowly declines over time. But what was seen both on the Bazaz and the E10 scores for severe dysphagia particularly is that the control group was uh, statistically different than either the IV or the local steroid group at six weeks postoperatively. This difference did disappear over time. So when we think about uh, prevention of dysphagia, we really want to look at uh, the uh, modifiable risk factors, including operative time. There has been some evidence, but not uh, sub substantial to uh, use decreased tracheal cuff pressure. Again, the, the evidence is equivocal on the application of steroids, one for and one against. People have talked about a choice of plate design or a zero profile anchored spacer, but that also has not borne out in the literature. Some people do all of the above. 
I now want to talk about esophageal perforation. There, there are several small case series as well as a handful of systematic reviews and reviews in the literature that talk about esophageal perforation and specifically management of it. Esophageal perforation is a, uh, occurs at a low incidence, uh, less than 2%. However, the mortality rate is quite high, up to 15 to 20%. We do see an increased risk in trauma and clinically, these patients often present with dysphagia, dynophagia, fever, neck swelling, and or wound leakage. The most common cause of uh, perforation is actually hardware failure in 41%. And we can see chronic erosion by hardware failure also. Less commonly is intraoperative injury, although this does occur in up to close to 20%. Most of it, unfortunately, is not recognized at the time of surgery and is recognized in a delayed fashion. We have also seen graft extrusion or penetration. In trying to diagnose an esophageal perforation, most folks start with x-rays to evaluate the hardware to look for any failure or back out. You see in this top picture, a plate completely kicked off the anterior cervical spine. You can also look for air in the sub sub Q space. Um, we have seen patients who have been scoped and they can see the plates uh, when the uh, ENT folks put down the scope. You can also look on MRI or CT for prevertebral collection or evidence of osteomyelitis discitis. Intraoperatively, if you suspect an injury, you can put down indigo carmine and see if you can see it in your operative field. Uh, the time to diagnosis, there have been uh, reports where it's early versus delayed, and we do see that more commonly when we have chronic erosion of hardware or hardware failure, we do see this in a delayed fashion. There have been uh, several methods of repair. Obviously, if you recognize this intraoperatively, you can do a primary closure. A recognition of this and calling your ENT colleagues is the uh, most appropriate plan of action. If it's a delayed fashion, often there's a need for a type of muscle flap. These have been uh, treated conservatively with NPO and allowed the esophageal perforation to scar over and heal. That is the least common method. Uh, the most common microorganisms associated with esophageal uh, perforation are coag positive, sorry about the typo staph, as well as candida and streptococcus. Uh, esophageal perforation, as I mentioned, is a uh, significant injury, and though the incidence uh, of uh, the injury itself is less than 2%, the incidence of complications associated with the injury is quite high. It can lead to pneumonia, mediastinitis, osteomyelitis, and even sepsis or death. So at the end of the day, we know that uh, injury to the esophagus, even something that causes mild dysphagia, can occur very commonly in anterior cervical surgery. And we always have to have heightened awareness uh, if there's any risk of esophageal perforation. Thank you.